Okay, admit it. You're breathing a little sigh of relief now that Christmas is over, aren't you? I heard people asking, not the question, you know, how was your Christmas, but how'd you survive Christmas, you know? It's a battle sometimes, isn't it? And it's nice when that part of it is done. You're not battling traffic and long lines at Target and trying to find a parking place and feeling guilty because all of a sudden you realize you didn't get a gift for someone you should have, and it can be pretty oppressive, can't it? We don't want it to be that way, though. We want our Christmas to be peaceful and tranquil. Here's a picture of uh, that first Christmas. This is actually not a photograph, but a painting representing that. When I was a kid, uh, I could not remember the word nativity, so instead of calling it the nativity scene, I used to call it the maternity scene, but <laughs> it fits, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it looks so, so peaceful and calm and tranquil and beautiful that that's how we feel like Christmas ought to be. But I think if that's all we see, we're missing a huge part of the significance of Christmas. As Jeff mentioned, we've been in a series trying to answer the question, you know, why Christmas? Why did Jesus come? Why did he become a human being? What's going on through all of that? And the, the teachings have been beautiful, encouraging, and edifying, and um, mine today is not going to be that. Because I feel, I've, I felt really strongly that we're missing a huge part of what God is doing in that very scene if we don't understand that part of the reason that Jesus came was to win the final battle. Look at this big book. World War II, a history of World War II. It is huge and amazing pictures, by the way. Um, it tells about the hundreds of battles that took place during World War II. It shows uh, the kind of military strategy that was used that sometimes was successful and sometimes not. It leads you inevitably through to those final uh, traumatic battles in which the war was finally decided. And I want to suggest to you today that when we ask and answer the question, why did Jesus come? Why Christmas? That a huge part of what, what our answer needs to be is that Jesus came to defeat Satan and to win the final battle. So in these next few minutes, three things I would like for us to do. One is I'd like for us to think a little bit about who Satan is and, and why this battle is going on. I'd like for us to look at some of the biblical accounts of these battles, this confrontation and this battle between Satan and God, and then finally to talk a little bit about some things that we need to do as we continue to fight in that battle. So um, I, I want to I want to ask you to pray with me for a minute, and uh, I just I realize uh, that what we're talking about today is so politically incorrect. Um, so much something that we don't like to think or talk about. I mean, who wants to talk about militant Christianity? You know, when was the last time a church sang onward Christian soldiers? You know? So um, pray with me for just a minute as we get going here. Uh, Lord, help us to see truth as you present it to us in your word. Uh, help us to be willing to, uh, to look at the hard parts of this beautiful Christmas story and to understand how they impact our lives today. Uh, it is in the name of our Savior Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, well, let's start out by talking a little bit about Satan. The Bible is teaching us that we are engaged in a war, and the Bible tells us it's not a war of, of against flesh and blood. It's not on a human level, but it's on a spiritual level. It's against the forces of evil in our world. And Satan is the one who is leading that battle against God. It's surprising, as important as Satan is, how little really the Bible tells us about him. He is assumed, and he's mentioned often, but he's not explained very well. And sometimes when it is giving an explanation about Satan, it's in kind of figurative language that forces us to kind of try to figure out what happened. So as we think about who Satan is, maybe the place we need to begin is thinking about who Satan is not. 
Satan is not God. He is not a God. In fact, all of the important things that we say we believe about God are not true about Satan. God is eternal. Satan is not. God is all-knowing. Satan does not know everything. God is everywhere. Satan is not. God is all-powerful. Satan is not. Satan is a being created by God. Now, we know, don't we, as we read the Bible, that God has created a variety, probably much more than we can appreciate, of spiritual beings. So the Bible refer to cherubim or seraphim or to angels. God has created and populated the universe with spiritual beings. So I don't know if God has created beings on other planets like he created humans on planet Earth, but I do know that God has created a world, a spiritual world of spiritual beings. Some of those beings are angels created by God. And the Bible indicates that even within the angels, there's sort of a hierarchy. And at the top of that hierarchy was Lucifer, son of the morning, you know, bright star, the, the epitome of God's creation, an amazing being. And Lucifer, in his pride and arrogance, wanted to be God. He wanted the throne for himself. And so Lucifer rebels against God. Here's the way it's described kind of figuratively in the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. It says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, you who were once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Satan wants to be God. He wants to be like the most high. And so in his rebellion and sin, God cast him out of heaven. And apparently, other angels sided with Satan, with Lucifer, in this battle against God. And they also were cast out of heaven. Those fallen angels are what the Bible usually refers to as demons. Now, maybe you have trouble when you read the, the Bible believing that there actually are beings like demons. But if you can believe that there are angels... It shouldn't be hard for you to understand that there are also evil, fallen angels, and those are in league with Lucifer in this war against God. Satan hates God. He wants to do everything he can to thwart God's plans. So if you want to hurt somebody, how do you do it? I mean, how would you go about hurting God? How could you fight against God? Well, Satan devised a pretty good strategy, and that strategy was not to, not to attack God directly, but to attack God's children. That's us. And so from the beginning of human history, we have this battle being waged in which Satan, as he's often called in the Bible, or the devil... That is Lucifer when he was this angel in heaven. That Satan is attacking God's children. And so it begins right at the beginning of human history. It begins for us in the Garden of Eden. When God has created Adam and Eve in his own image. His son, his daughter. To live a life of abundance in perfect relationship with him. How Satan must have been irked by that. That there were these beings, this race of people that God has created who are going to love and worship and praise God. And so Satan moves in. He plans his strategy and he attacks. And he takes the form of a serpent. I don't know if that's literally the case, that he was in the form of a snake, or whether that's a, a derogatory term that's used about him. We know that in other places, like in Revelation, Satan is called a serpent or a dragon. In Revelation uh, chapter 12, it says, the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. 
So Satan, in some way, goes into the Garden of Eden and he's fighting for the souls of Adam and Eve and their descendants and he tempts them. Now, God has done a beautiful thing in the Garden. Adam and Eve, loving, worshiping God, so grateful to him. I can, I can imagine Adam and Eve saying in their hearts, I, I just wish there were some way I could express to God my love and my gratitude for all that he's given us, you know. And God's saying, okay, here's a way you can do that. The tree over there, just don't eat it. Don't eat from that fruit. And every time you don't eat from it, you'll be saying to me, God, my Father, I trust you, I love you, and I will obey you. One thing that God set by which Adam and Eve might express their love and obedience to God. So, of course, that's where Satan is going to attack. And he moves in and he presents to them the idea that God has lied and that, in fact, they would be better off eating from that tree than not. And so, as we know the story, Adam and Eve take the fruit of the tree and they eat it. And it was not that there was anything special in that fruit, but in that act of disobedience, you know, their relationship with God was shattered. And Adam and Eve are cast out of God's presence, out of the Garden of Eden, and they begin to experience the consequences of their sin. That abundant, full life is over. And it's not at that point that they die physically, although it's through that that death enters into the world, but they die spiritually. They're cast away from God. I went to a, a church-related college, and I remember when I was in college that my religion professors um, were pretty adamant that the stories like Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and the fall were not true historic stories, that they were myths, that they were fables that were made up to teach a certain point. And I was persuaded by them. I'd grown up in a Christian home believing the Bible. I was a Christian. But I began to think, well, maybe, maybe that isn't a true story. Maybe it isn't the way I've understood it before. And in my struggle uh, with faith and with doubt at that point, God used something kind of significant to help me kind of pull back into faith. And it was, it was this book. It's a science fiction book. I love science fiction. And it's called Paralandra, and it's written by that amazing Christian author, uh, C.S. Lewis. He actually wrote three science fiction books, and this is the middle one. And in this book, Paralandra, he sets up a situation on another planet just like Adam and Eve, where these first two created beings on that planet are tempted by Satan to disobey God. And I read this book, and all of a sudden, it, it seemed to me like it could happen that way. It makes perfect sense to me now that God would have done what he did in the Garden of Eden. So if you're struggling to believe this account of this first spiritual battle, I'd encourage you to read these three books, and particularly this middle one, Paralandra, C.S. Lewis. You can find it online, or I'd loan you my copy. So Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, and uh, their relationship with God has changed. And yet God is not beaten. It seems as if Satan has won that battle, but it's only the first battle. And God continues to love and care for Adam and Eve. He provides clothing for them through, through, with animal skins, through the death of an innocent animal. And God begins to foretell the event by which God will bring redemption to Adam and Eve and all of the descendants of Adam and Eve. And here's, here's the way God says it as he's talking to Adam and Eve and to Satan himself. And he says, I, that's God speaking, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between Satan and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his feet, his heel. Now, that's pretty significant. God is saying through the seed of woman, it's interesting, seed is always referred to for the father, not the mother. He's saying from the seed of woman, for 
telling, I believe, the virgin birth through the seed of woman, God is going to eventually win the battle. And Satan will strike his heel, that is, he will hurt this seed of woman, but ultimately, the seed of woman, this one whom God is sending, will crush the head of Satan. And so the battle is on. And from that point on, we find Satan doing everything he can to lure God's people away from him. And throughout the the Old Testament, you read about how Satan is working to pull people away from God into satanic worship. All idolatry in the Old Testament ultimately is satanic worship, satanically inspired we see the works of demons as they, they work in the world to, uh, to destroy and to hurt, to bring about war and disaster and oppression and abuse. So we move ahead. Let me just mention another, the, another battle that comes up. God has indicated that he's going to bring redemption through the descendants of one man. That man is Abraham. And through Abraham's descendants, God is going to bring this seed of woman who will ultimately crush the head of Satan. So if you're Satan and you've got these demons, tens of thousands of them, I assume, in our world, causing all the havoc and pain that they can, but if you know that God is going to be working through the descendants of Abraham who were called the sons of Israel, sons of Jacob or Israelites or Hebrews, Where are you going to focus your attention? Where are you going to strike? You're going to focus there, aren't you? And so at one point in the history of the Hebrew people, there's been a famine in that area of the world, and the only place that really has food is in Egypt. And so God, as he has maneuvered the chess pieces, has seen to it that one of the descendants of Abraham actually has a place of prominence in Egypt, and he is able to bring his family his father, Jacob, and his brothers into Israel where they are provided for and cared for. And they're given a place to live and it's a good life for the Hebrews there. God has seen to it that they did not perish in the famine. But what happens then? This Pharaoh who has known this Hebrew Joseph dies and another Pharaoh comes and maybe another one after that till it gets to the point where the Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, doesn't know who Joseph was, doesn't know even why these Hebrew people are there, but he's afraid of them because they have become so numerous and strong. He's afraid that if there were a war that they would side with Egypt's enemies. And so he decides he's going to oppress them. And here's what it says in the first chapter of the book of Exodus. It says, the Egyptians made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. And the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, those are names you don't hear a lot anymore, are they? (laughs) Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Now, the Egyptian society at that point is built on a culture of slavery. It's the, it's the Egyptian slaves who are doing the manual labor, who are making the bricks, who are building the cities. And, and, and the Pharaoh makes an astounding decision. That is that he's going to wipe out these slaves. He's going to see to it that they exist no more. And so he commands that when, when Hebrew children are born, if it's a girl, she can live. If it's a male, kill it. Now, if that happens, how many more generations of Egyptians will there be? None, right? He is, in effect, saying, I'm going to destroy the Hebrew people. Now, why do you think Pharaoh would make a decision like that? to destroy the, you know, the very people on whom their economy is built. He did it, I am convinced, because Satan put it in his heart. Because Satan, in his strategic planning in this war against God, sees that if he can wipe out the Hebrew people, it's done. God's promises cannot be fulfilled. There will be no redemption for humanity, and Satan will have won. But we know what happened, Right? that God won the battle, that God saw to it that 
the Hebrew boys were allowed to live, you know, that he raised up from one of the Moses who led the, the Israelites out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land that God had given to them. And so all through the Old Testament then, we see that God is fighting this battle against Satan as again and again Satan is trying to pull people away from God into idolatry, into immorality, and God is fighting back. Maybe you have trouble reading the Old Testament. I know a lot of people do. One way to read the Old Testament is to look at it through that lens. To, to, as you read it, to say to yourself, you know, what is Satan doing here and what is God doing? How is the battle progressing? Because it's not just that, that this is a book about war. This is a book about war too. This is a, an account of the battle that has been raging between God and Satan. And so for generations, for hundreds of years then, this battle rages until finally God takes the next step in this plan of salvation, and that brings us to Bethlehem. How much did Satan know about what was happening at Bethlehem? How surprised was he when he saw that God himself actually became a human baby? I don't think he had understood the incredible love that God had for his people. I don't think he understood the extent to which God would go to bring redemption to his people. And so maybe it caught Satan by surprise. But again, his strategy would be, if I, can, if I can stop it now, if I could kill this baby, then it's all over. I win and God loses. And we need to remember how close it came to happening. Do you realize that that peaceful, tran tranquil maternity scene turns violent very quickly? The Magi, the three kings, come to Jerusalem seeking him who is king of the Jews. And when Herod the king hears about that, he's frantic, he's afraid, he's desperate. And so he finds out you know, where God said this baby, this king of the Jews, would be born, in Bethlehem, just a few miles from Jerusalem. And he tells the Magi to go and find the baby and then come bring him word so that I too, he says, may go and worship him. God warns the Magi, and they don't go back to, to Herod. And Herod then is so angry, he's so furious, he decides he's going to kill every baby. And he commands the Roman soldiers to go to, to Bethlehem and the surrounding vicinity and to kill every baby boy. How close did he come to putting an end to that life that we celebrated this week? Let me read you from Matthew 2. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were no more. It almost happened. Satan almost won there in Bethlehem through Herod and the Roman soldiers. Jesus could have been killed along with all those other babies so easily. But God was not to be beaten. And he had warned Joseph, and Joseph had taken Mary and baby Jesus, and they had gone to Egypt until it was safe for them to return. And so when you read the Gospels, the story of Jesus' life, you see that spiritual battle continuing to take place. It takes place as Jesus begins his earthly ministry, as Jesus goes into the wilderness and he is tempted by Satan. You realize the significance of that event? If Satan could get Jesus just once, just once to obey God, it's over. He's won. If he could just once get Jesus to say no to his father, I'm going to do it my way, and he offers him fame and power and the kingdoms of this world, if Jesus would give in just once, Satan wins. 
because it would mean that Jesus could not die for your sins or my sins. He would have to die for his own sins. All the way through his life then, Jesus is being tempted by Satan, not just in the wilderness. I believe every day the temptation was there for Jesus to choose his own way, to choose a way that would be less painful. And so finally, Jesus gets toward the end of his life, and again, Satan is at work. Here's what it says in, in the Gospel of Luke. It says, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priest and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. Did you catch that? Satan put it into Judas's heart. In John, as he's talking about that last night that Jesus is spending with his disciples, celebrating the Passover, the Lord's Supper, it says, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. I, I wish I knew what, what Satan was thinking. I wish I knew what he thought when Jesus was hung on the cross. Did he really think he had won? Was he celebrating? Was there a party among the demons as he watched the Son of God hang on a cross and die? Did he really think, finally, I've won, it's over, God himself has died? And when did it finally dawn on him that that death was the very means by which God won the war? That death provided for us forgiveness and salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so, toward the end of this book about World War II, it points out that, in fact, the war was won. There were still battles going on, but the end result was inevitable. This book, too, tells us about the end of the war, that the result is inevitable. In Revelation, it tells us how the war turns out. It says in chapter 20, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan will be defeated. He has been defeated. And ultimately, success and victory will be to God and his people. In the bulletin, I listed three things that I think we need to do as we continue to battle Satan. God tells us that we need to be on the alert, that Satan is still roaming like a roaring lion, seeking who he may, he may devour. And that includes you and me. He's trying to devour us to cause us pain and hurt. Three things that I would suggest very quickly that, that we do. The first is that we need to speak the truth without compromise. Satan is the father of lies. Truth always hurts Satan. We are to speak the truth lovingly, but we are to speak the truth uncompromisingly. Secondly, we are to love unconditionally. We are to love others the way that God has loved us, and when we do, Satan loses. And finally, we are to have unbeatable faith. We are to have the kind of faith that knows the end of the story, that knows who wins the battle, and knows that there's nothing Satan can do to separate God's people from him. Let me just read to you one section from Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is it who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, well, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is unbeatable faith. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, I am convinced that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation, and that includes Satan and every demon who's aligned with him, that there is nothing else in all creation that is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when you're packing away that maternity scene and putting it back in the box till next year, you remember that there, beginning in Bethlehem and ending at Calvary, God won the war. And take a moment to thank him for it. Uh, Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for making us in your image. Thank you for intending for us to be able to live life in perfect relationship with you. And... uh, We need to take seriously the threat under which we live, that Satan is trying to harm us. He's trying to destroy the church. He's trying to move people as far away from you as possible. Help us to live in a way that brings glory and little victories day by day to you. We pray in the name of our Savior Jesus, the conquering King. Amen. Amen.